And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation. And it shall be a statute forever in your generation. The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our program today is The Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, written by Morton Wishingrad. It is presented in observance of the 18th anniversary of the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto. <laughs> It is a prayer for the dead. Hail Mole Rahamim. Hear him with reverence, for it is no ordinary prayer. And they are not the ordinary dead. They are the dead of the Warsaw Ghetto, the scapegoats of the centuries. Once the priest robed himself in linen and stood on Sinai in a convocation of Israel, and they brought unto him a live goat chosen by Lot. And he laid his hands on the goat's head and confessed over it the iniquities of the people. And he released the goat. And its name was Azazel, scapegoat. And it fled into the wilderness. But for them in the ghetto of Warsaw, there was no release. There was only the abyss. In the ghetto, 35,000 stood their ground against an army of the Third Reich. And 25,000 fell. They sleep in their common graves, but they have vindicated their birthright. Therefore, let him sing and hear him with reverence, for they have made an offering by fire and an atonement unto the Lord, and they have earned their sleep. <laughs> My name was Isaac Davidson, and I lived in the Polish city of Lublin with my wife, Deborah, and Samuel, our son. When Poland fell, they herded us into a cattle car and transported us to the ghetto of Warsaw. It was a place in purgatory, and around that purgatory they had built a brick wall and another wall of barbed wire, and beyond the wire stood a third wall of soldiers armed with bayonets. All right, all right, there, move on, next, 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 lively. Come. Your name? Isaac Davidson. Who are they? Devorah Davidson, Samuel Davidson, my wife, my son. Three blue cards. Get along. Next, 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 move on, pick up your feet. There's no funeral. Three blue cards stamped with the letter J, bread cards. Each card, a pound of bread a week, as precious as life. Devorah held the cards in her hand, and we went to the tenement in the Tvarda district, to the place where we were to live. We went up the stairs of the tenement, and Samuel and I waited in the hall while Devora spoke to the woman who lived there. Uh, they said you would know where we're supposed to stay. Yeah, come in. This is where you stay. In this room. But you live here. In this corner. The other corner is yours. But I thought... You that... don't know how lucky you are. This room has a window. Well, perhaps we shouldn't trouble you. Maybe some other place. Hmm. <laughs> You'll find out. Before they walled the ghetto, 50,000 people lived in these slums. But, but I, Do you I, know how many there are now? 500,000, a half million. I know a man who sleeps in a vault in the cemetery. So don't be a fool. Come in. It's still better than the cemetery. That was our room. And because Dvorah lived in it, it was also our home. There was no soap, but she cleaned it. There were no needles, but she made a cloth for the table. There was no lamp in it, yet she filled it with light. And then when she found the box, our son Samuel scrabbled up some earth and a few pathetic blades of grass, and Dvora put the box on the sill of the window. There. Now our house has a garden. Yes, Dvora. Our house has a garden. You say it as though it is not true. Look, Isaac, look at the sun. 
There is no land where the sun doesn't shine. Now let it shine here on something green in the ghetto. Green grass in the Warsaw ghetto. A few pathetic blades of green in the scrabbled earth. But a sign of living spirit and a proof that where the spirit lives, there can be no degradation. There, in this place of death, shut off, walled in, foredoomed, there were things of the spirit done by men and women like Dvorah. In the ghetto of Warsaw, there was beauty and comradeship and learning. There are seven marks of an uncultured man, seven marks of a wise man. Uh, do you know what they are, Samuel? The wise man does not speak before him who is greater in wisdom mm -hmm. and does not break in on the speech of his fellow. He is not hasty to answer. He questions according to the subject matter and answers to the point. Mm -hmm. He speaks upon the first thing first and upon the last last. Regarding that which he has not understood, he says, I do not understand it. And he acknowledges the truth. And the mark of an uncultured man? The reverse of all these things. Hmm. Very good, Samuel. You're a good boy. What? Weisman's theory of germinal continuity. Teacher, I can't finish the recitation when they talk. Uh, please, please, all of you. This is a classroom in the ghetto. It is different from other classrooms. We must be an example. Thank you. Go on, Esther. The theory of germinal continuity. The germ contains living matter which has come down in unbroken continuity ever since the origin of life and which is destined to persist in some form as long as life itself. While Wiseman's name is chiefly associated with this theory, <laughs> I thought this was a class in sculpture. Apparently, I'm wrong. What's this supposed to be? I don't know. Maybe I'm one of those surrealists. Well, don't give up. I'll make a sculpture out of you yet. It's all right with me. If you're willing, I'm willing. My father made me a plumber. I guess I'll always be a plumber. Now, if I had my tools and a piece of brass pipe, I'd show you some real <laughs> sculpture. <laughs> Say, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Uh, wider, wider, a little more. There. That will do, boy. Why didn't you bring him earlier? It's my fault. I didn't know there was a clinic. His tonsils are badly infected. They'd have to come out. Oh, well, I don't have any money to pay you. There's nothing to pay here. Money can't buy what no one will sell us. No? No. We need drugs, instruments, anesthesia. Th then you operate without anesthesia? Please, doctor. W will it hurt? Yes, it will hurt. In the ghetto, everything hurts. Perhaps tomorrow, it will be different. The ghetto waited for tomorrow. It tried to do so with dignity and self-respect. Sometimes it was hard. But the ghetto tried. In the cellars of the tenements, the children went to classes, and wherever there was a patch of dirt, the older boys studied agriculture. Carpenters taught their trade to clerks with thin chests. The watchmaker and the leather workers opened trade schools. The artists taught their art. And all of this was free. Whoever wanted to learn was welcome. It was a sober, grim, melancholy place, heavy with the foreboding of death. But we encouraged each other to work and to study and to laugh. Yes, to laugh also. We organized four theaters. <laughs> But our greatest pride, our finest symbol, was our orchestra, the Ghetto Symphony. All right, we'll try it again in the same place. Now watch me. Please, please, watch the stick. We're going to start together and finish together. All right now, watch the stick. We sat and listened to the Ghetto Symphony, feeding our hunger on the clear, sweet sound. But since the Heron folk, the master race that erected the walls, since they intended that we should be hungry, they came and confiscated some of the instruments. First they took only a few, then more. Our orchestra dwindled. It became an ensemble. And then the Heron folk came again and stole more instruments. The ensemble became a quartet. And then... A single solo violin was left. 
Why did they do it? Perhaps it irritated them. Jews satisfying a hunger. We were left with hunger, and where there is hunger, the plague always follows. The plague came and 17,800 persons died of spotted typhus in Warsaw. And of these, 15,758 were Jews. A pestilence imprisoned behind the brick wall. A great achievement of medical science. I say it without irony. Yes, 15,758. And Dvora Davidson, my wife. 15,759. Samuel, leave her. You cannot help her anymore. Mama, Mama. Come here, come here, Samuel. She cannot hear you. You are a big boy. You mustn't cry. Here, let me wash your face. She wouldn't like to see you with a dirty face. Stop crying now. I'll try. Will you do something for me, Samuel? Yes, if I can. I want you to go to your corner. I want you to try to go to sleep. I couldn't. I couldn't sleep, Papa. Then go to your corner and turn your face away. Mind me. Do as your father says. That's right. To the wall. You're a good boy, Samuel. You won't hurt her, Papa? No one can hurt her. I am taking off her clothes, her apron, her dress. Uncle Avram's shoes. Everything. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Going to carry her into the street? Yes. <laughs> After dark, I'm going to carry her into the street. And I will leave her there. Cold, naked, nameless. <laughs> you know why I must do this, Samuel? They must not be able to identify her. They must not know who she is. It's because of the bread card, Papa? Yes, it is because of the bread card. If they identify her as Dvora Davidson, they will take it away. They must not be able to identify her. Please, Papa, please, let them take it away. Not in the street. It is her last wish, Samuel. The bread card is for you. Honor her last wish. The blue card with the letter J. A pound of bread a week for her son. I can't. You must, Samuel. Once you took her milk. Now you must take her bread. She leaves you nothing else. You must take it, Samuel. It is your inheritance. This was our degradation. In the ghetto of Warsaw, we divided dead men's bread. The taste is bitter and it is dry in the mouth because the saliva will not flow. This is what we ate and this is how we live. The 500,000 in the Warsaw ghetto. But not 500,000 for long. On June 22, 1942, armored cars escorted a convoy of black trucks into the ghetto. They seized men and women and children and packed them into the trucks. And these were the uncoffined dead who never returned. And each day thereafter, the black trucks came. And each day when they left, there was weeping in the ghetto. I have seen the faces of the men that did these things. They were men like other men. Some were old, some were young, with eyes, with skin and flesh and nails and the requisite number of fingers. I looked into their faces and did not believe. But the trucks continued to come. 
And it must be said that if the thing that they did was monstrous, it was a monstrous thing done with order and with method, for they take pride in order. July 22nd, 1942. 6,298. Destination, Trembling Cup. July 23rd. 7,815. Destination, Austria Champ. July 24th. 7,444. Destination, Belchek. Done with method, precise, efficient, recorded. To Tremblinka, Asvetchem, Gelzik, Sobibor, Madjani. A lethal gas chamber, an electric furnace, a poison pit, an execution field, a cemetery. And add also 10,000 brave, hopeless, tragic men who seized sticks and stones and knives and bare fists and charged the tanks and tried to halt the trucks. Add their bodies to the list for the 10 days of June 1942. Make your total, and then add two precise, methodical, documented months in August and September 1942. Reckon it. Do it carefully. You cannot do it on your fingers. No, let me give you the sum. Listen. 275,954 fewer bread cards in the ghetto. Swift, accurate, final. Quicker than typhus, shorter than hunger. They sent the black trucks because the hunger and the pestilence were too slow and too merciful. When we were starving, we beseeched the civilized world for food. And when the plague struck us, we appealed for simple things. For soap, medicine, for tools for our physicians. But when the black trucks came, we no longer asked for rescue and for mercy. We asked for weapons. Through the Polish underground, which carried our appeals, we asked England, Russia, and the United States for weapons. And there was silence. You did not answer. And then through the Polish underground, there came your answer. Resolutions of sympathy phrased with felicity. It was a greater injury than silence. I, who know, can say to you that the grave does not yield its tenant for such coin. Nor will such coin inspire the enemy to lie down and crimson the gutter with his blood. We waited for weapons that did not come. Five hundred thousand waited. Three hundred thousand waited. One hundred thousand waited. And finally, thirty-five thousand who did not know where to look. But the answer came from under their feet, from the sewer under the Warsaw Ghetto. Carry it gently, Pan Meyer. Don't let it fall. I'm carrying it as though it were a case of eggs. More gently than that, Pan Meyer. What could be more fragile than a case of eggs? A case of dynamite. Rifles are already distributed. Our men want to know if there'll be any machine guns. If we can get some through, there will be machine guns. But don't count on it. You'll have to make out with rifles. Won't be much against tanks and mortars. It will be better than bare hands. Yes, better than bare hands. Much better. The ghetto council would like to know your name. Ah, what difference does it make? They want to thank you. Tell them to thank the Polish underground. Take good care of those barrels. There are enough grenades in them to blow up every Jew in the ghetto. Then there must be enough grenades in them to blow up every German in Warsaw. I'm glad you see it that way. What do you think we've been waiting for? April 19th, 1943. 35,000 men, women, and children stood ready. It was the day. Trenches were dug during the night. Every house, every room, every cellar, every roof was prepared. At 4 a.m., a detachment of stormtroopers in light tanks escorted the black trucks to the walls of the ghetto. They came as usual on their daily errand. We waited until the vehicles were within range. The entire detachment was wiped out. In a few hours, they came again. SS troops. Our snipers manned the ghetto wall itself. 
we were ready. They brought up a loudspeaker. That and the flags of the allied nations which floated over the roofs of the ghetto. More answers. 800 answers. 800 factories producing material for Germany blown up by our engineers. They brought up the regular army. The ghetto had defeated the stormtroopers and now it was the ghetto against the German army. We retreated slowly from our positions as they sent flamethrowers, mortar, cannon, tanks, and planes against us. April 20th, April 25th, May 2nd, May 6th, May 10th, May 14th, May 18th, May 20th, May 22nd, May 25th. They planted landmines under the tenements and blew them up one by one. The tenements crumbled, but from the rubble of the shattered cellar, the snipers kept up a continuous fire. The surviving men and women and children retreated slowly from house to house, erecting barricades in the streets, paying with their lives for every tenement, every room, every step of the way. When their ammunition ran out, they used broken furniture as clubs and hurled stones. On the 20th day, the enemy shut off the water supply and planes dropped incendiary bombs. The entire ghetto was in flames. Those who were not burned alive were slaughtered by the Nazis. Isaac Davidson! Isaac K. In the trench! His right arm had been blown off at the elbow. I spoke to him. Let me tie a tourniquet around your arm. Don't waste the bandage on me. Tell me, how's it going? We're still fighting. After 37 days, a few Jews with guns fighting a Nazi army for 37 days. The blood ran from the shattered stump and soaked the ground, but he smiled. They're really very foolish. We should have known that the ghetto would explode. They know now. How many did we kill? Some say 1,000, some say 1,200. The smile lingered on his lips even as his eyes began to glaze. And he spoke an epitaph for the Warsaw Ghetto. It is not for thee to complete the work, but neither art thou free to desist from it. Tell them to mark that on my grave. Yes. Tell them to mark it on our graves. It is not for thee to complete the work, but neither art thou free to desist from it. Hear him with reverence, for he sings a prayer for the dead, 25,000 dead. It is no ordinary prayer, and they are not ordinary dead, for they are the dead of the Warsaw Ghetto in the year 1943. Tonight, they sleep in their last trench. Their choirs dispersed in ashes. Their holy books sodden in the seventh month rain. The rubble deep on the thresholds of their houses. They were Jews with guns. Understand that. And hear him with reverence as he chants the prayer. For on the page of their agony, they wrote a sentence that shall be an atonement. And it is this. Give me grace and give me dignity and teach me to die. And let my prison be a fortress and my wailing wall a stockade. For I have been to Egypt and I am not departed. <laughs> 
And now we take great pleasure in presenting Mrs. Isaac Stern, wife of the noted violinist and chairman of the women's division, Israel Bonds for Greater New York, Mrs. Stern. We have just lived through but a small moment of one of the most important events in Jewish history, the revolt of the Warsaw Ghetto. This past week we observed Passover, and soon we will celebrate Israel's Bar Mitzvah, 13 years of sovereign statehood. These three events mark significant milestones in our history, beginning with the exodus from Egypt, then the first and possibly only mass revolt against Nazis by Jews, and finally the creation of Israel. Passover has become a family holiday, remembering traditionally the plight of our forefathers. The story of the wall encircling the Warsaw Ghetto happened only 20 years ago, and yet how many people realize today the entire scope of the atrocities committed against Jewry during World War II. I'm grateful to Morton Wishengrad, writer of today's program, and to others such as John Hersey, Millet Lampel, for bringing to us by their great talents with words and action the story of a tragedy that we must never forget. No matter who we are or where we belong, for many of us, life is no longer the same because of the events in the Warsaw Ghetto. Young people should become more acquainted with that part of history. As long as there are minorities in unjust discrimination, we, living in a free country, should do everything possible to prevent further recurrences. Our honor is at stake, and our identification with our past remains unforgettably a part of us. As Dr. Harry Estrick of Temple Emanuel Grand Rapids recently wrote, in reliving the events of the Warsaw Ghetto, we may catch the rhythm of our people's changing mood in defeat and triumph, their power of affirmation of life's essential goodness, their mockery of the oppressor, their rainbow of hope in the midst of blood and tears, their desperate cry to mankind, not to forget the enormity of the crime. Last year, I accompanied my husband on his concert tour to Poland. During my stay in Warsaw, I wanted to recapture some of the memories of the former ghetto. While walking on the now rebuilt grounds, I realized that the grass now growing there was covering the most inhuman extermination of a great Jewish civilization. I saw the bunker of the resistance where the last 18 fighters of the Jewish underground got word that everything was over. There was no hope left. One killed the other, and the last one killed himself. The only reminder now is a stone inscribed in Polish, Yiddish, and Hebrew in their memory. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Our eternal light drama today, The Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, was written by Morton Wishingrad. It was presented in observance of the 18th anniversary of the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto. Cantor Robert H. Siegel sang the liturgical music. Leon Janney was featured as Isaac Davidson. Others in the cast were Santa Sortega, Peter Leza, Bina Rayburn, Athena Lord, Maurice Tarplin, Theodore Goetz, Guy Rep, and Roger DeCoven. This is Vic Roby. Our program was directed by George Vutsas. Portions of this program were pre-recorded. This weekly program is presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This is the NBC Radio Network.